Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Angel Ito. Brandis Friedman has the evening off. Thanks for sharing a part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, we hear from former President Obama at the groundbreaking for his new presidential center in Jackson Park. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Local doctors break down what's behind the disparities in outcomes for black women. Guilty on all charges. Reaction to the R. Kelly verdict from Chicagoans who have been following the stories of survivors for years. And meet one of the new MacArthur Genius Grant recipients and hear more about her commitment to social justice. And meet a group of students saying yes to clean energy and working to bring solar panels to the west side. First off tonight, the Obama Presidential Center is a bit closer to reality. That's after the former first family, Barack and Michelle Obama, returned to Chicago this week to break ground on the center in Jackson Park. Now, the move comes after years of legal battles, gentrification concerns, and a federal review. We were on site for the groundbreaking. Here's some of what the Obama said about choosing the center's location. One of my greatest honors is being a proud Chicagoan, a daughter of the South Side. I still lead with that descriptor. I wear it boldly and proudly like a crown. It's close to where Michelle grew up, where I started my political career. It is surrounded by vibrant neighborhoods and a community where we believe we can help make a difference. And Jackson Park also happens to hold a special place in my heart because it was literally my entryway into Chicago. For more on the Obama Presidential Center groundbreaking and reaction from community members, please visit our website. For women in the U.S., breast cancer is devastatingly common when an eight women develop breast cancer over the course of their lifetimes. And for black women in the U.S., what comes after the diagnosis is especially worrying. The mortality rate for black women diagnosed with breast cancer is 42% higher than that of a white woman. And a particularly aggressive subtype called triple negative breast cancer is more likely to present itself in black women. Joining us now with more are Michelle Hicks-Turner, Cancer Control Strategic, Strategic Partnerships Manager for the American Cancer Society's North Central Region, Dr. Serby Warrior, a physician at Rush University Medical Center, and Dr. Arlene Richardson, a radiologist and chair of the Department of Radiology at Jackson Park Hospital. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Let's get right into it. Dr. Richardson, why exactly are we seeing these disparities in black women? Well, I think one big reason is access limited to lower quality of resources inside and outside the hospital system. Um, it kind of contributes significantly to all of the disparities we see in our community. So like there are many different social determinants of health from economic instability, including unemployment, um, lower quality environment, including housing and transportation in our community, lower quality and lower level of education, lower access to uh, high quality foods, and also lower quality healthcare systems in our community. So I think all of those things contribute to that. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Warrior, I noted that you've done research um, at Rush University's Medical Center on the disparities in breast cancer research. And one of your findings was that triple negative breast cancer has a higher occurrence among black women. Can you give us a breakdown of exactly what that is and why it's particularly concerning? Yeah, so we really wanted to understand where the disparities exist at you know, the Chicago population and especially in black women who are being treated for breast cancer. So we looked at 
data for over 20 years of breast cancer patients who had gone through our comprehensive breast program, and that's over 8,000 women, to identify areas of disparities. And what we found were that black women were more likely to have poor prognostic factors for breast cancer. One of the things that we found were that black women were one and a half times more likely to present with metastatic disease, meaning that the cancer had already spread to different parts of their body, meaning it was you know, much less curable. But we also found that black women were 2.1 times more likely to ha um, have triple negative breast cancer. And both of these are you know, big areas that lead to higher recurrence and mortality rates. And especially for triple negative breast cancer, what that means is that you know these breast tumors don't express the hormone receptors of estrogen or progesterone or the HER2 protein. And this is what usually breast cancer-directed ter therapies target, which makes this type of cancer really difficult to treat. And triple negative breast cancers are already a higher grade tumor. Uh, they're more aggressive and have an overall poor prognosis. Um, a few risk factors that you know are associated with triple negative breast cancer that studies have found is that um, higher parity, meaning higher number of pregnancies and um, decreased uh, breastfeeding, which is more common in black women, uh, put this patient population at higher risk for triple negative breast cancer and poorer prognosis overall. Now these numbers are pretty high. I do wanna follow up and ask um, triple negative breast cancer. It seems like a, a, famil a rarely new term. Um, can you tell us why we're just kind of learning more about it? Yeah, so one of the reasons why, um, you know, we're trying to understand disparities is because we've realized that different patient populations don't have as good access to care, meaning they're having poorer prognosis in their overall treatment. One of the things that we found with triple negative breast cancer is that these patients are doing poor overall, and we've identified that black women are more likely to have triple negative breast cancer. A lot of more research is being done in this field, um, and a lot of funding and um, resources are being allocated to better understand triple negative breast cancer and treatment for this area. But the patient population that's the most likely to have triple negative breast cancer, which is black women, don't have access to these clinical trials to be involved mm. in this research, making this area a little bit more difficult to understand. Mm. That's a great point. Um, Michelle Hicks-Turner, let's toss it over to you. What do you think that healthcare organizations need to be doing to address these disparities? Well, first, know what the breast cancer burden is in your communities, similar mm -hmm. to what Dr. Warren Richardson echoed, um, echoed before. What contributes to the disparities in screening and mortality rates among black and white women? And then take actionable steps to eliminate those barriers. For one, we know that these disparities are rooted in policies that contributes to the barriers to care. And one is that simple things that a healthcare system can do is not everyone can take the time off during the week to, to doctor's appointments or so offering weekend and evening mammogram appointments are crucial. Yeah. Also to ensure uninsured women receive the care they need. Hospitals can strengthen their partnerships with faith-based organizations, um, referring providers and promote the utilization of the Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. And this would allow low-income, uninsured women across the state to care. Hospitals can also think about their local partnerships, partner with the American Cancer Society and other programs and employ large employer base, faith-based organizations. Other, um, think about ways they can utilize their community benefit investments to reduce disparities, whether adding uh, navigation services, community health workers, or offering transportation care or child care. These are some of the things that the healthcare system can do to change the disparity rate in Illinois. Absolutely. And Dr. Richardson, I feel like this is a great time to mention the new technology that you all are working with to help with early detection. Can you tell us a little bit about Project Health Equality at Jackson Park Hospital? Yes, uh, we're excited about it. So Project Health Equality is a collaboration with nonprofit We're at Aid, Black Women's Health Imperative, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, and led by Hologic. So through this program, Jackson Park Hospital has received some state-of-the-art 3D mammography equipment, and 3D mammography has proven to be superior when compared with 2D mammography alone as a, for a detecting breast cancer, particularly in dense breasts, and which is more common in the Black and African-American uh, community. 
So in addition to this technology, there's other support of innovative care, including public education and nursing navigation that will be added to our site to improve our screening and treatment for women in our community that might otherwise go without. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Warrior, can you tell us just a little bit uh, more on why it's important to follow up on that aftercare uh, with the outcomes for black women? Yeah, so one of the things that we found is that um, black women, especially black women from lower socioeconomic status communities, just have a lot more difficulty in having access to health care. And, um, you know, even the women that do get involved in the system and get access to health care, they're having a lot of difficulty with follow up throughout their treatment. Um, I think that we kind of heard a little bit about this, but just Having, when we did our analysis of why there was a lot of areas where patients weren't following up, we found that it was due to difficulty with childcare and transportation, as well as um, even get difficulty getting time off work to go to their doctor's appointments. And a lot of these competing social and economic demands that patients go through make it difficult for patients who are already presenting with advanced disease to adhere to months and months of you know chemo chemotherapy and radiation and overall breast cancer care. and this long-term impacts their overall mortality and their cancer outcomes directly. Thank you so much. Now, Michelle Hicks-Turner, I do wanna wrap with you. Can you just tell us a little bit uh, more on why you think that it's important for black women in particular to go and get those mammograms? There's that general stigma of being afraid to go to the doctor, but just maybe leaving us with some parting um, encouraging words. Exactly. Go get your mammogram. It's very important. It saves lives. Um, it's imperative that you do it. I know initially it can be scary because you don't know the outcome, but I think it'd be more scary if you didn't do it at all and you had a chance to prevent a late stage diagnosis. The earlier you catch it, the better your chances are to survive. So please get your mammogram. Absolutely. Follow up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Our thanks to Michelle Hicks-Turner, Dr. Serby Warrior, and Dr. Arlene Richardson. Another major story this week was the conviction of disgraced R&B singer R. Kelly. Now, a jury found Kelly guilty on all charges he was facing in the federal courtroom in Brooklyn. The 54-year-old faced racketeering and sex trafficking charges 13 years after being acquitted of child pornography charges here in Cook County, where further charges await him. Now, earlier this week, we spoke with Shahrazad Tillett with A Long Walk Home. That's an organization that aims to end violence against women and girls. Now, Tillett was also a consultant for the Lifetime documentary, Surviving R. Kelly. We also spoke with music journalist Jim DeRogatis, who was among the first to report many of the Kelly allegations. Here are their reactions to the verdict. I think it was historic on two levels. Number one, uh, we have never had a bigger, more dangerous predator in the history of popular music. It is now fact and proven and convicted. Number two, this was the first significant uh, prosecution of a predator uh, that focused almost exclusively on black women. Uh, you know, we've had the Me Too movement see several powerful men come down. Their victims were often uh, famous white actresses. These were black girls dating back to the first 15 year old. The verdict for me was bittersweet, um, really because it has been so long in the making. And I really think about what justice has looked like or what justice should look like. And this is one part of it, but really what we need to examine is why so long, why this, this wait for black women and girls and how many systems have really failed these girls and women and sexual assault survivors. Now to watch the full interview with Tillit and Dee Rogatis, visit our website. Up next, Brandon Fried Brandis Friedman introduces us to one of the new MacArthur Genius Grant recipients that's in a conversation recorded earlier. The MacArthur Fellowships, the so-called Genius Grants, are awarded annually to individuals who've shown originality and dedication in their creative and or scholarly pursuits. 
one of this year's 25 MacArthur Fellows, just announced this week, lived in Chicago for years and studied at Northeastern, Northwestern, and the University of Illinois. Kianga Yamada Taylor is currently a professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, and she joins us now. Kianga, welcome back and congratulations. Thank you. Glad to be here. So first, tell us about that phone call you received when you uh, when you found out when the MacArthur Foundation called you. Uh, I was saying, um, I was telling someone before that um, I have a, my phone number still has a 773 uh, area code. And I think for the last few months, I have been getting a very aggressive spam um, from the 773 area code uh, about student loans, about extended car warranties and, you know, various other things. Um, so when I got the call, uh, I had been answering these 773 calls over the summer uh, to demand to be taken off the call list. And so when I got the call, um, I, the number is 773 because the foundation is located in Chicago. So um, I picked up the, the phone very tersely, um, ready to uh, engage in another you know, verbal confrontation to take me off the list. So. Uh, I was home and, you know, I was with my five-year-old who was between in the space, between the end of daycare and the beginning of kindergarten. <laughs> I was about a week between the two. So um, I got the call around lunchtime and, you know, kind of and that five-year-old, out. Yeah, their yeah. face probably <laughs> went from, you know, like they were watching your face change from anger to, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. He did, he did look concerned for uh, about a minute. Um, you know, while I was on the call. So uh, I did go from um, anger to confusion to bewilderment and uh, <laughs> the space of about 10 seconds. <laughs> so let's talk about what it is that got you noticed and the work that, you know, warranted this uh, award. You've lectured on historical problems that are very much still with us. Tell us a little bit about those. So my work uh, kind of is a combination of uh, I look at uh, both historical issues that have to do with racism and discrimination in public policy and in private enterprise. So I'm trained as a historian, um, but I also write about contemporary uh, race and politics and, and social movements. And I guess the kind of through line uh, between the two is uh, really trying to identify what is meant by systemic racism um, again, in public policy and in the activities of the private sector, uh, I look at them historically through the lens or window of housing and housing discrimination. Um, but I'm also interested in the ways that uh, black people, black communities uh, respond um, to these issues of discrimination and the way that uh, black people organize themselves, the way that they uh, understand uh, the nature of, of their uh, oppression and exploitation, um, the, the reasons behind uh, uh, segregation that emerged out of black communities, um, and the way that that becomes also a foundation for um, political opposition, resistance, rebellion, uh, and organizing as and well. And you and I have talked about this a bit, uh, even you know before you left Chicago and headed to Princeton, yeah. um, particularly about like redlining in Chicago. Uh, and the city, yeah. of course, has a very rich history in many of the topics that you explore. Uh, how does how does your time in Chicago um, and the history of Chicago factor into and shape some of your work? I mean, my experiences in Chicago were a driving force behind me even making a, a decision. To, to go to graduate school. Um, I uh, lived in Chicago for long before I had decided to return to school. And one of the, the questions that um, eventually pushed me in that uh, direction um, really had to do with why is Chicago so segregated? Uh, when I moved to the city in 1998, uh, it was one of the, the first things that uh, struck me um, you know, I was moving from New York State where there are degrees of uh, racial segregation, residential segregation, but because of the compact nature of the city, um, it's really, you know, block to block can be radically different. And, you know, in Chicago, I mean, when I arrived in the city, I, you know, exited the highway at 75th and Stony Island and 
you were literally driving for miles in an all black enclave. Um, and I grew up in the South. I grew up in, in Dallas, Texas, and I had never uh, seen this level of racial separation um, in my life. And so I, you know, I lived in, in Hyde Park uh, for a while. Uh, and I moved to Pilsen and then I moved to, uh, to Logan Square. And you see this kind of racial enclosure um, uh, throughout the city. And so and that was really, yeah. Yeah, well, I was just going to say before we let you go, because we've got about 30, 45 seconds left, you know, sure. $625,000 over the course of yeah. five years comes with this award. Any plans forming uh, just yet on how you're going to put that to use? Sure. I mean, you know, I'm working on a, a couple of books. Uh, so this is kind of like a research money windfall. Um, and then uh, I'm also working on a kind of multimedia um, uh, project with a former staff editor from the New York Times that uh, looks at race and politics and organizing from uh, a black left left wing uh, perspective. And so we're hoping to be able to launch that um, sometime in 2022. But okay. it's exciting. It's a you know it's an exciting period to uh, kind of jump into these issues of uh, race politics and organizing. All right to do so, the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Con congratulations again, Kianga Yamada Taylor. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to see what you do next. Thanks so much. Back with more Chicago Tonight Black Voices right after this. A group of students on the west side are determined to make a big change in the neighborhood by confronting environmental issues and working to bring solar energy to their community. Chicago Tonight's Joanna Hernandez met with some students to learn more about their vision for Garfield Park. I feel like it's important that you should know like what's going on throughout your community and how like you can solve bad things like the bad energy. If we had a whole like acre of solar panels, we could actually power the whole neighborhood. You Senior know? Kara Turner is one of Jasmine Jones students at El Rabi High School in Garfield Park. These young adults have put what they've learned in their environmental justice class into action. Knowing about low, low birth rate and like having asthma comes from the community that you in and like where you come from and stuff like that. So I didn't know that, but I learned it when I took the class. A class that has opened their eyes to issues that impact their daily lives. I learned that approximately 98% of children come out with asthma due to pollution while their mothers are pregnant. It all started when Jones realized she wanted to challenge her students and change the way they viewed science by involving their environment. I wanted to not only make it a real world application, but how is it justice centered? How is it actually using science as a tool to intervene in this socio-political sphere and really impact students' lives? I mean, imagine how much work we get done. If we Jones launched a solar panel project where students have an opportunity to think like developers. They quickly realized the benefits of having solar panels installed in their community. It's a great idea overall, just in general, because of the pollution and the climate change that's going on. So having it here in Garfield Park is a good thing because it's a lot of stuff that go on around here that people really don't know about. They have their eyes set on the Garfield Park Conservatory right across the street from the high school. The solar panels will provide clean energy without producing air pollution. Over the course of 15 years, the conservatory will be saving over a half a million dollars just from the energy savings. Joining the Illinois Solar for All program, these students have been able to speak with the contractors, engineers, and eventually be part of the design process. That is a program that really focuses on helping to get solar panels in neighborhoods like ours, what we call environmental justice communities. So these are communities where the environmental score, when you research it, it is very unhealthy. The students are hoping to submit their final proposal by the end of the school year as they work on finding funding for a big project they say will benefit the community for years to come. We're going to be seeing changes, like stuff is going to be turned around for our community. It won't be. We're just standing by. We're actually taking precautions to make our community a better place for us. Along the way, the project is empowering these students to find their voices. I start feeling real good, like, because, like, I feel like I was helping the community and, like, being a leader. It kind of makes me feel like a boss because it's like I'm doing something 
that does some good to me and like other people. The students have been in contact with the Garfield Park Conservatory about their vision. And as of right now, a spokesperson for the park district says they're open to the idea and are waiting to review a final proposal from the students to make an assessment of the benefits before providing final approval. It's very important because we live here, <laughs> you know, and for so long, other industries and people, honestly, communities who don't live here have been dictating the conditions under which we live. I think that in the future, I would say to the community to look forward to learning more from the students because they are going to be the ones teaching, hopefully communicating and sharing. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Joanna Hernandez. Now Jones and one of her students have been invited to attend the UN Climate Summit next month. More details about the students on our website. And that's our show for this weekend. Join Brandis Friedman and Paris Schutz next week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Angel Ito. Thank you for sharing a part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.